Hello, everyone. Welcome into the Sports Plus podcast for the week of February 15th. Well, we're all snowed in here in St. Louis. We might as well talk some sports because there's not a whole lot else to do. I'm Corey Miller here today with Frank Cusimano, Andy Moeller, Anna Yates, and Amon Hicks. Let's get right into some Cardinals talk. We're just days away from being able to use one of my favorite sports phrases, pitchers and catchers report. And Jupiter, Florida sounds pretty darn great right about now. And it's really amazing what a few moves could do to make you more excited for the season. Uh, Amon and I were just talking about that last week. But we're all excited. Projections are not excited about the Cardinals. Dakota, specifically the annual baseball prospectus projections, say that five times fast. They don't even like them after the Arenado trade. They think they're going to finish third with a 500 record. Ahmad, what, what do you think of that? Well, obviously, they don't. They aren't. They aren't giving the Cardinals much respect. Obviously, I think by having them uh, pick third to finish in the conference, but it's also goes to the Cardinals in, in years past and what they've shown us. Like, can this team really compete? Like, I know the St. Louis. We all look at the bullpen. We all look at the starting rotation. And like, oh, they have this piece, that piece, that piece, and you know, if these guys do that, they can be really, really good. But I think what the rest of the baseball world is saying is. Can the Cardinals live up to expectations? Yeah, they can be really good with the pieces that they have, but they have not put it all together in years past. So I guess it's kind of understandable why they have the Cardinals ranked there until everybody com- you know, comes together and plays on the same team and really does the things that we all expect them to do. I don't think you can really have the Cardinals ranked higher just based on the roster because, I mean, if we look at rosters in years past, we should be able to compete for a World Series and you know at least make a deep push in the playoffs, and we haven't done that, so... I guess it's kind of fitting. Oh, would I pick them to finish third in the NL East or NL West? Absolutely. But they're in the Central, which they, nobody else wants to win either. And I kind of think these projections just want to get Cardinals fans uh, riled up. The Braves, heck, the Braves are picked to finish third in the East somehow. Uh, so that's definitely something to talk about. And Cardinals fans uh, digging their teeth into that. You know, they're not going to be silent about being picked third. But it is finally settled. I don't think we've quite talked about it in depth yet. We're getting Adam Wainwright and Yadier Molina back for at least one last ride this year. Andy, do you think this is it? Or uh, Molina definitely didn't say he's done. He said, we're going year to year. We're going year to year. And he wanted two years. We knew he only got one. Do you think this is it for both of them? One of them? How do you see that shaking out? I, I'm not quite sure where they've met along the way, but I think Yachty and Tom Brady have uh, a sort of a competition that they're going to see who's the one who's going to be the last man standing. And they both may play until they're in, in their 50s. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I just, I don't know. Um, as far as Wainwright is concerned, I think he, uh, he'll, he'll be the one that decides that he's done uh, and he'll know it before anybody else. Yachty, I think, is just going to keep playing. Yeah. I I mean, he wanted those two years. They didn't give it to him. And I think they're going to have to have a hard conversation after this one. I think it's, I think it's finally going to be time for somebody to, to break it off because I don't think he's coming back after this year. I think the cart – because if Andrew Kisner will be totally wasted and they'll have to trade him for sure, I think. If Molina is you back like for another done year. with Carson Kelly? Yes, they do have the luxury. They got an even better prospect in Herrera waiting in the wings. But I don't think they want to go through two young catchers. So I think this is it for Yachty for sure. Now, I was Frank, just about I to say – Go ahead. Go ahead, Amon. Cor- maybe, maybe Frank can answer this. But, I mean, think back to when Yachty first took the job and, you know, he took over from Mike Matheny. Nobody was really ready to see Mike Matheny part ways with the Cardinals. But yet we had to give the guy, you know, the up-and-coming guy, Yachty, a chance. Frank, can you kind of go back in the day and what that was like, letting Matheny walk an experienced guy like that and seeing Yachty take over and what that may mean for Kisner coming up in the coming years? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I think Molina was more highly regarded than Kisner defensively, but Yachty really had offensive issues. I can remember that the, the first season when Larusa did not pinch hit for him in a crucial situation that cost the Cardinals a game. And we asked Tony about it after the game. And he said, look, it's April. He goes, I'm going to need this kid in August. And I, I got to let him know that I believe in him. But offensively, he was a challenge. He was a work in progress when he got here. And it was a tough transition because Mike Matheny was highly regarded. Not that he was Johnny Bench offensively, but he was great defensively. And you were just 
kicking him to the curb for this catcher who hadn't hit yet. Now, I think, by the way, the difference between Brady and Molina is Tom Brady just threw 40 touchdown passes. Yadier Molina is not going to throw, is not going to hit 40 home runs. He is a probably a below average offensive catcher. I'm glad he's back for another year, but I, I think that if I had to guess, I think the Cardinals probably think this is going to be his last year. He may shock us all and come out and hit 12 home runs and knock in 55 with a decent OPS, but I think this probably is the end for Yachty. Looks good in the Caribbean series. Hannah, what do you think? Hannah? I think we lost Hannah. That's all right. Or the technology is killing her right now with the mute button. That's the beauty. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's the beauty of doing this uh, via Zoom. Let's talk. Another Cardinals pitcher made some headlines this past week. Jack Flaherty defeating the Cardinals in arbitration. I think it's the first time I saw the Cardinals had lost an arbitration case since like 1994. I have some strong thoughts on this. Jack Flaherty has some strong thoughts on this. Cardinals, I'm, I'm pretty upset with Cardinals fans, to be honest with you. Just if you look anywhere in the last couple of days, they are still coming for this guy's throat, and I just don't get it. Frank, you shared some thoughts on this whole situation. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think the system is the thing that's flawed. It's just a bad situation that the group that owns the club has to say negative things about the player that they want to succeed you know, in a big time fashion. Um, he got $3.9 million. The whole system is screwed up. I, I don't like arbitration. And I don't like the fact that a guy like Juan Soto can be like the best player in baseball and, or, or one of the five best offensive players in baseball. And he'll make like $600,000 this year. Th- they got to find a way to, to balance things out that if you're one of the best players in the league, then you should be paid like it and you shouldn't have to go through this whole arbitration process and not have any negotiating power till like you're a six year vet. So I don't like it at all. I, I know that Jack Flaherty did not win fans by saying I took it personally, but if the Cardinals are saying bad things about you, how do you not take it personally? So it's just a tough situation. The thing I think, I think yeah, fans I like don't, Oh, sorry, Andy. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I think the thing fans don't understand when they get frustrated that a player is, I get a millionaire is asking for more money. But when you're good, you want to be paid like it. And I think that goes to every American in everyday situation. You know, like you have a job, a regular job that you have and you're due for a raise at the end of the year. Well, you want your money that you are due. You know, you just worked extremely hard for 11 and a half months. And now when it's time to reap the benefits of your contract and your situation, you want every penny that, you know, will be giving towards you. So I think the same with Flaherty. And just like all these other athletes, you have to get as much as you can while you can, because in 10 to 15 years, they're going to be saying like, hey, you're worth, you know, $200,000. So you need to get all those millions millions why you can right now so I think that's something fans have to understand you would be the same way in your regular life or your regular job if your contract came up you will want as much money as possible and not seeing only, fans, yeah, what, seeing what, what, fans what, what, try to oh I'll go real quick Andy it, seeing yeah, fans just try and save more money for owners just continues to astound me I really don't understand it but Andy go ahead no I, I think if you go back and look at the guy that he's compared to Bob Gibson Let's put let's put uh, Gibson in Flaherty's situation. Do you think Gibson would have done anything differently than than what Flaherty's doing? Absolutely not. He would have he would have come out and said, "Yeah, I'm taking it personally. Yeah, he'd be going for the three point nine million. I can't. I and I you know I can't imagine the Cardinal fans would be turning you know turning on Gibson like that. I want somebody who's got some fire in his belly. I want somebody who's going to be competitive like that." to be my ace. So I, I think it's very short-sighted. It's a good point, Annie. Hannah, do we have you back yet? I think we still lost Hannah. That is, that is our technological uh, uh, incapabilities here. Hopefully we get her before the end of this. Let's go. Spring training starting this week. Like I said at the top, I'm going to get everybody a chance. Who's your breakout spring training pick? Who might surprise us? So you can get it in before it happens, and you can look smart. We'll go. We'll go Ahmad first here. Who do you think, Ahmad? I'm going Dylan Carlson. 
Why not? Dylan Carlson, I think he'll have a chance to be an everyday outfielder. And I just think with all, you know, he, he got all the um, the unrealistic expectations out the way last year. You know, coming in on the pandemic shortened season, everybody thought he would be this 15, 20 home run guy and just save the Cardinals offensively. I think he got, he got a year of uh, off season to kind of relax, mature, take things in, kind of, you know, dissect some film. So I'm, I'm picking Dylan Carlson to be the breakout guy this year. Frank? I'll go Paul DeYoung. I think that 671 OPS was an aberration. I think the Cardinals are going to figure out a way to get him rest. And with him having some really good hitters in the lineup around him, a little less pressure, I still believe in Paul DeYoung. Andy? As far as a breakout, I think I'll, I'll just go with, you know, with the guy that, um, you know, I'm going to go with Alex Reyes. I think that He's finally, he's, you know, usually after you've had, you know, major surgery like that, you got to give him sort of a, you know, sort of a red shirt year and, and let him get back to, uh, let him get back to where they were. And I think he's going to come out and I think he's going to start showing why he was such a highly, uh, highly rated prospect uh, two or three years ago. I am, I'm very pleased to hear we have multiple, uh, people buying tickets to the Alex Reyes hype train because I think when he he's still I'm still a big believer he's gonna figure it out he's young uh he's gonna have a big year in 2021 my guy though for spring training specifically is gonna be Justin Williams uh you traded Dexter Fowler you're gonna let these young guys play and you hear Harrison Bader you hear Tyler O'Neill you know Dylan Carlson you don't hear about Justin Williams a whole lot he was a pretty big prospect the Cardinals got from the Rays in that Tommy Pham trade He's a left-handed hitter. I think he could work his way in onto the roster, into the lineup. Maybe if he plays his way, if he outplays Tyler O'Neal uh, at the plate for sure. So I think Justin Williams could be a guy to watch this spring. Hannah, do we By have the way, I love that. I love the Alex Reyes pick, guys. Uh, being a fashion guy that I am, I think he has the best swag as far as shoes on the field. It was Dexter <laughs> Fowler, but he's gone. So Alex Reyes is like Team Jordan, him and Yachty, big fans of those guys. I wonder who's going to get Dexter Fowler's shoe closet in the uh, Cardinals locker room. Dexter had his own little, he had his own little corner over there that was just shoes. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot I, of think, stuff <laughs> I think we're still missing Hannah. Hannah, if you happen to hop on here, just say something. We'll get you in here. But I'm alive, I'm alive oh. and well, everyone. There she is. There she is. It's been a thrill. I love Zoom. I can't wait until this pandemic's over. Well, you hopped on right at the perfect time. We're talking Blues. They just wrapped up their seven-game series, although don't call it that uh, to Craig Berube because he'll bite your head off against Arizona with a loss in that seventh game. I'm just happy that they're going to play somebody else with San Jose coming up. Hannah, this stretch against the Coyotes, it wasn't pretty, but it wasn't, like, terrible, terrible. What, what's your diagnosis of these current Blues? I don't think I would call it a train wreck, but I think there were some games that were just – pretty brutal and honestly I mean you look at today and the fact that the Blues can't get on the board consistently is a concern at this point you look at the two previous games even in the win I mean the wins were basically you can attribute it to the secondary scoring you don't have those veteran presences stepping up every day you don't have consistent goaltending in some of the situations but in in terms of that goaltending how much can you place it on the goalies at this point when you have defensemen who really I mean they were out blocked in, in terms of block shots the Coyotes blocked three times as many shots as the Blues did today alone and it's just a kind of a difference across the board and so many they were out hit which is supposed to be kind of that forechecking identity that Craig Ruby is trying to kick up a notch and so I just feel like they've not really meshed into what their identity is you saw a glimpse of it three games ago but there's really just no consistency. And now you're going to potentially be missing a Tory crew game to game as well. So a lot of veteran presence is missing from the lineup now too. Yeah, it's a good point. This defense really, I, I feel like Colton Pareko has been playing hurt all year. He hasn't been the guy uh, people have expected. Tory Krug, hopefully it's not too, too bad of an injury. They've already missed a couple guys out here and there, but I'm on a guy you and I were both pretty hard on last year with Justin Falk. And he's making us eat our words right now. How much fun has he been to watch this year? 
Well, I think he's been really fun, especially when he got those two goals the other night that helped him beat the Coyotes. But I think what you're witnessing now is just a guy who's getting in an opportunity. Last year, he kind of had the waiting Alex Petrangelo shadows and always have to look over his shoulder, you know, when is Petro coming back on the ice. I think speaking from, a, you know, being a former player and athlete, when you don't have someone looking over you or you don't have a starter in front of you, you kind of just breathe a little sigh of relief and you, you kind of think to yourself, I can play my game. I don't have to worry about fitting the mold of what this guy does or what that guy does. You know, now I'm just being myself. And I think that's what we're witnessing this year, a guy who's playing freely and a guy who's having fun, most importantly. For sure. And we could get some exciting news. Vladimir Tarasenko back on the ice, made the trip to Arizona. So hopefully we can get Vlad, Vlad back on the ice there, get some more offense infused. Let's move on. We'll talk the Rams lawsuit. A lot of chatter around at St. Louis lately. We know it always plays well. Andy, you and I have talked about it a bit. We don't want any cop out. No Zoom trial. None of these guys getting out of showing up and sweating it out in person. But what's, what's a few more months to wait to make make it safe and get these guys here in person during the pandemic we want to see them here right i want to make it completely healthy for you know for for them so they have no trepidations about you know about performing their civic duty and being honest when they're uh when their feet are put to the fire and have to uh have to explain away how uh how they how the how they just so, you know, spit in the face of St. Louis and, and took the Rams and put them out in L.A. Frank, you've had your finger on the pulse of this. The latest news, how the ringleader of that just sham of a town hall, Eric Grubman, one of the just greasiest looking guys I've ever seen, got out of being deposed, at least at least at first here. What's the latest on the depositions and how much is Grubman a piece of what the St. Louis team is looking to do? Well, I think he's a big part, and he is going to be deposed. Uh, they have uh, two dates already set up with him now um, because, you know, I think for the average fan, they, they have to know this, that this is not about the Rams having the ability to leave St. Louis because of that top-tier clause, which they did. It's about the Rams giving St. Louis false hope. It's about the National Football League and Eric Grubman holding those ridiculous town halls and thinking that we could save our football team. And in the process, Dave Peacock and Bob Blitz spent $15 million to try to keep the team here. And it was all deceptive. And I think it's going to be proved in court. And that's why St. Louis has got a great chance to win this lawsuit because they had no intention at all of keeping the Rams here. Looking forward to it. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be spicy to say the least. I can't wait. And I want to see go Rams for sure. Oh, there's go a mod, of course. Oh, can, I mute, can I mute? Can I mute him? Can you pot him down, please? <laughs> wait, hold on a second. Let, let's just ask this, Ahmad. It's it's one thing to root for Aaron Donald and the Rams, but do you yeah. want the city of St. Louis to lose this lawsuit against the Rams? Okay, did I honestly, stutter? speaking from a – no, you did not stutter. From a sportscaster side, I have to be on the side of St. Louis because all of our – I won't say all of our fans, but a lot of our fans were, you know, pretty upset when the team left. Now, me being a realistic fan and just a regular old person, do I care about that stuff? No. Am I going to benefit? benefit anything from it no did i benefit anything from when the rams were in town no did i go to all their games no i turned down so many opportunities for free tickets when they were so bad so it's just kind of like i can't feel some type of way about a team leaving that we didn't own to begin with they weren't ours to begin with they came here from another place so i mean it is what it is you know it's just kind of like hey you know i get nothing from them winning or losing so i could care less i just like the rams football team I was with them when they suck, and I'm with them when they're good. So I can't, I can't jump off their ship now. I just can't. I'm not the host here. Otherwise, I would have muted Ahmad for our listening audience. <laughs> to absolve I myself. couldn't be around the horn, and you just, and you just, yeah, you just yeah. Muted. <laughs> Thank goodness right, we're we can... taping this, so we can edit that out. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> we got an anniversary. We're recording this on February 15th, and uh, 43 years ago today, I believe it was. One of the biggest upsets in boxing history, a big St. Louis connection, Leon Spinks over Muhammad Ali. We just lost Leon Spinks a few days ago. Annie and Frank, you guys both uh, saw, 
got, we're around to see a, a lot of his rise and that whole family's rise to to be in one of the biggest deals to ever come out of St. Louis. Frank, what's your just your your memories of Leon Spinks and really how big that match against Muhammad Ali was? Well, it was just totally shocking that this guy with seven pro fights from Pruitt Igo would beat the greatest of them all, Muhammad Ali. It was just, it was the coolest thing. And, you know, I've got, I got to know Michael, I've gotten to know Michael pretty well. And, and Michael had the good life where after the Tyson loss, he got the 13 million and has lived happily ever after. But Leon has had a struggle and he's had financial problems. They said after the second Ali fight that he came back and he basically had no money after all the handlers took their piece of the pie. But I don't want fans to forget that Leon Spinks was a Marine. He was an Olympic gold champion and a heavyweight champion. And I'm proud that he's from St. Louis. Andy, do you remember that fight like it was yesterday? I, I can tell you exactly where I was when I found that out. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine, um, <laughs> okay, uh, nerd alert. Uh, we were at the Maynard Ferguson concert uh, at the Belleville Scottish him. Rite Temple. I've seen uh, him in person too somehow. I've seen I've, Maynard Ferguson too, of course, the yeah. theme from Rock. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so anyway, he was at the Scottish Rite Temple in Belleville. And um, my buddy's dad, the one who drove us over there, uh, had Camel X on. We were, of course, we were all sports fans. I don't know uh, if the, the Blues had played that night or whatever. But anyway, he had Camel X on. And we were getting in the car right at the top of the hour. For CBS Radio News, and the first story right off the bat was that Leon Spinks had beaten Muhammad Ali, and we were all like, "No way!" And sure, it was it was so cool to think that uh, you know that a St. Louis and was the you know was the heavyweight champion of the world, and he'd beaten quite possibly the most famous man on the planet Earth to do it. All right, that is the final buzzer, and we're rapidly approaching March. Big deal for our local hoops teams. But right now, if you had to guess seeds for Mizzou, Illinois, and SLU, where do you think they'd slot in at? This could be really interesting because Mizzou was in the first, like, uh, the first bracket revealed by the NCAA uh, selection committee. They were a four seed. That's dropped probably in the last week. I doubt they're still holding on there. Ahmad, where would you slot Illinois, Mizzou, and SLU at seed-wise approaching March? I think Illinois is a top four seed, especially with Io DeSumo. I mean, just a leader on the court who's proved uh, he can get buckets whenever the team needs him most. So I think top four seed for them. Um, please uh, don't hate me when I say this, but I think SLU, I think until they get one of those wins at the end of the year, that's like, oh, wow, like this is, they need to be in there. I just think with, the way things have gone with the pandemic, uh, them missing games, having to postpone games. It is hard to say that SLU is a top 10 seat, which we would have thought they were. So I'm thinking maybe just, you know, 13, 14 for those guys. And then Mizzou, I think a top 10 seat for them. Uh, even though they've been inconsistent lately, I still think those guys are pretty good. So I think they all make the tournament. I just think SLU is probably the lowest seat out of the three teams. Frank, should we be worried about SLU not making the tournament at this point? I don't think so. I think they got their mojo back. And I think with that first half against Fordham, even though Fordham's not great, was so dominating. I, I think they're not going to have any more stumbles. I think they'll end up being like an eight or nine seed. Uh, Mizzou, probably a six or seven. And Illinois, uh, you know, maybe a two, as high as a two. Who knows? Maybe a one before it's all said and done. I, I think Illinois is going to the Final Four, though. I've said it all Frank, year. You don't, Frank, you don't think there's a chance – because, you know, they don't like to give – they like to pick and choose from conferences how many teams they take. Who's SLU kind of have to look out for, St. Bonaventure, or, or who are they competing against when it comes to bids? Well, St. Bonaventure has the highest net ranking in that conference. So I don't know if it's a three-bid league this season because it hasn't been a great league with Richmond not, uh, you know, playing like many people thought. So, yeah, that, that, it's SLU and St. Bonaventure, I think, have the best shot as we speak. Andy? Just looking at the just looking at the standings the other day, and you see, you know, uh, uh, the top of the, you know, the teams that have played, you know, ten and thirteen conference games or whatever, and then you've got to go way all the way down and see, you know, slew in their three and two conference records. So, you know, I I think that people um, that aren't really paying attention to the Atlantic Ten 
uh, may overlook SLU. So I think SLU is going to have to continue to win and be impressive doing it. Uh, you know, the thing with Mizzou, I'm, I am not completely sold on them because I think, you know, things almost have to play out perfectly for them to win, it seems like, these days. If they have any, you know, any piece that, that's not playing very well and certainly not having Tillman in the lineup for these last, uh, the, the game on Saturday and then uh, the game tomorrow night, um, that's a problem as well. I think things really have to be clicking well for Mizzou to, uh, you know, to do well. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them drop uh, into maybe a, uh, certainly a nine seed uh, and maybe even a, you know, a 10 seed uh, Illinois. I'm, I'm in the consensus there. I, you know, I think they are really good. Um, but I think that, you know, and I think that I think a three seed is not out of the question for them. Yeah. And I can, uh, my contention is this is going to be the most unpredictable seeding of an NCAA tournament that I think anybody can remember. There is, there are so many wild cards because of uh, you know, what the, the COVID culture or the, you know, the, the atmosphere around that is, is doing. Uh, I just think it's going to be really hard to, to nail down uh, a team that, you know, would be a consensus to win it all. And I'm taking Gonzaga and Baylor, uh, you know, in that. The pollsters like Mizzou a lot better than the analytics. Like their net ranking is 37 this week. SLU's net ranking is 32. By the way, I forgot about VCU. They're 31. So VCU, SLU, St. Bonaventure, two of those three will probably get in. But, yeah, Mizzou's going to have to gonna have to finish this thing off. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I've, uh, I've gotten increasingly worried as I watch. And without Jeremiah Tillman, I, I, they have no presence inside at all. And it's going to be come down to the matchup, I think. Even with Tillman, I think it's going to come down to the matchup and turn who they pull. But, yeah, I'm on the Illinois train, too. I think they're going to end up with the, one of those. Top, I think they might get one of those top four seeds. I think either them or Ohio State. I don't know if they'll take two Big Ten teams in, in those top four seeds, although the Big Ten has been the best conference in basketball. But, uh, and, and I'm crossing my fingers for SLU. I don't want to get too comfortable because I really like the A-10, and I usually pick them in tournament games. So I'm hoping SLU is one of those two teams, Frank, to stay. Hannah, Hannah, do we have you or not? I am here. I am here. I was Anna, off, but I am back. I am back Anna, in well. <laughs> Hannah is back. We'll get her back for for this final buzzer question. Hannah, where would you? I will. Go I will. On? You know, I do think that Illinois. I could see them definitely being a top three seed, and I think that's. I mean, out of these three teams, obviously they're solid. I would assume, as you mentioned, just absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love watching him play. I think Illinois could potentially be a two seed if this continues and I know that the projections have been favoring them as that. So I, I'm not narrowing that out of the picture. Um, Missouri, I just, I had so just high hopes for them after beating Bama and then they just come out and it's just that inconsistent play like we've seen before. And so I know that they had been projected higher, but I do see them dropping to maybe like a seven seed by the end of this. I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping you know, I could see them being 60, but I mean, Andy mentioning just even a nine seed, I, I really hope it wouldn't get to that. But I do think that maybe like a seven seed is what I project them there. And for SLU, I'm kind of hopping on the same boat as Ahmad. I know everyone's given their turn, so I'm not trying to take that side. But like a 13, 14 seed for SLU, I do think maybe they'll come out with some big wins um, by the end of this. But I do think they make it in and, you know, have that type of projection. Well, we know when Mizzou is a high seed, things don't go well. So maybe, <laughs> maybe a maybe a root for for come to keep You're sliding. You're too young to be jaded like the rest of us are. Oh, cool. I don't, hey, I, don't I didn't know go to Mizzou, Mizzou so I can say Mizzou. that. You're so right, Corey. You're so right. And I live for Saturday nights with Morgan and Casey because I did not go to Mizzou, and I get to say those things. So you're so right. As long as they don't have to play Norfolk State. So let's get this straight. Ahmad is rooting for the Rams against the city of St. Louis and doesn't like Mizzou. How do you feel about ice cream and little kids? <laughs> hey, I like I got root for SIU Carbondale, okay? That's my school. Right. I don't have to ride that bandwagon. I just, like I tell Corey, I call it how I see it. And SIU Carbondale is nothing to brag about, nor are we ever expected to be any good in football or basketball. So when you guilt trip us, it does not feel bad. Now, for Mizzou, uh, yeah, you guys are supposed to be good. You have top recruits. You're ranked inside the top 25. So 
yeah, you guys should live up to higher expectations compared to my SIU Carbondale. Salute. I don't know which top recruits you're, you're talking about, but I think Porter Moser and Loyal is going to make SIUC's conference look good there. Uh, and I know Frank, I think Frank feels the same way on that one. Oh, for sure. And so they they off, the, the, off the top, like, I saw, you know, BC fired their coach today in the middle of the season. Why they did that, I have no idea. But when they, uh, one of the uh, the, the writers uh, was speculating on, you know, the list of possible candidates, and Porter Moser's name was on it. Well, as he told us this week on radio, um, he lives by the Rick Majerus line that don't ever run from happiness. And, you know, growing up in Chicago, his kids are in school there. They're winning a lot of games. Eventually he's going to go, but he's not going to go for the sake of going. Like he, he had the St. John's job a few years ago if he wanted it, but he turned that down. So he's going to go sometime, but I don't know if the BC job is that appealing. 